Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, a trip back in time. We're on Mackinac Island to get the history on Fort Mackinac. The Americans took over Fort Mackinac after the War of 1812 again, uh, and they continued to garrison until 1895. So it was a fort that had a very long history. And we'll finish up the birch bark segment with a look at trumpet building. <coughs> Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above. The trout lies deep and still These are what I treasure The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan Sound of horses clopping along Carlos streets, the rich smell of fudge thick in the air, and a unique sense of relaxation and disconnect from everywhere else. Mackinac Island is a popular destination for tourists from near and far, but its history reaches far beyond the modern days of a ferry ride over and a box of tasty fudge. Fort Mackinac, or Michelin Mackinac as it was originally called, dates back to the 1700s and played a role in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, in the Battle of Mackinac Island in 1814. It was America's second national park before becoming Michigan's first state park. It's home to some of the oldest buildings in the state. Today, visitors can tour the fort and explore its original buildings. Exhibits, demonstrations, and cannon firings bring to life everything from military training and battles to medical treatments and family life within the fort. Fort Mackinac is Michigan's only revolutionary era fort. Um, it uh, came into existence in 1779 when the fort, which was originally located on the south side of the Straits, was moved here to Mackinac Island, and that was because of the American Revolution. Uh, the fort by that period was under British control, and owing to some American victories down in uh, Ohio country, they felt very threatened. The fort on the south side of the Straits was built right on the beach, very vulnerable to cannon attack from a sailing vessel if the rebels brought it up here. So the British made the decision to move the fort and the community over here to Mackinac Island. Um, and that occurred between 1779 and 1781. The island offered things that the mainland location lacked. Uh, these nice high bluffs to put the fort upon, uh, and in addition there was a nice harbor here. The British moved the fort over here, but of course the American Revolution ended with an American victory, and part of the Treaty of Paris uh, in 1783 put the Great Lakes region into the new United States, so this became an American fort. It took 13 years for the Americans to finally get here and take the fort over. No one was really sure that this American United States thing was going to last. The new country was in no position to take over these outlying outposts, and the British really didn't want to give it up. Uh, they were still running the fur trade in this region. But finally, in 1796, the Americans officially took over Fort Mackinac. The British marched out, the Americans marched in. But the British didn't go very far away. They went to about 40 miles uh, to the east, to St. Joseph's Island, and there established a new fort. That was the closest available British territory to the Straits of Mackinac, showing what a strategic location this still was. And so the British were in a very good position when in 1812 hostilities erupted again between the United States and Great Britain. The British found out about the declaration of war first in July 1812. The Americans were unaware of it and they snuck over here and surprised the Americans. Uh, they had built this fort, the British. They knew that its fatal flaw was it was very vulnerable from an attack from the rear without another defensive uh, installment uh, back behind the fort. Something the British had planned from the beginning, they had never done. 
Uh, the Americans hadn't gotten around to doing that, to putting in that additional fortification. So the British exploited that fall and they took over the fort, demanding surrender. There were 600 British regulars, again, that had snuck onto Mackinac Island under cover of darkness, waiting behind the fort. There were 60 Americans in Fort Mackinac on that day. So the American commander um, uh, surrendered uh, almost immediately. Um, he said later, in order to prevent a general slaughter, all I could do was surrender. Uh, this was one of the, if not the first, uh, land engagement of the War of 1812 in the United States, the capture of uh, Fort Mackinac. <laughs> All right, we're about to have our Firearms of Mackinac demonstration where we show different time periods of different soldiers that would have been stationed here for Mackinac over a nearly a hundred year span. Beginning with the War of 1812 with myself going over how there's a rather some interesting combat that was occurring up here on Mackinac Island. Uh, there was actually a Battle of Mackinac Island during the summer of 1814. And then we'll transfer over during the Civil War, how the island served as a prison of war camp for about five months. And then we transfer quick over to the 1880s, which we mainly focused on our programming, when the soldiers stationed here were essentially serving as park rangers for the National Park. We'll be talking about what they were doing up here in those exact times. For, they were up here for rather unique, unique purposes. But also, we're talking about their arms they would have been uh, using, and we're going to try and shoot them off for you at the very end. By 1814, the War of 1812 was still ongoing. Uh, by that time, there had been some major uh, American naval victories on the Great Lakes. They were ready by July of 1814 to come and try to recapture Mackinac Island. Um, they tried to fire on the fort from the water below. They couldn't raise their cannons high enough to do so, so they went around to the back of the island to that same point the British had marched in uh, back in 1812. Again, it wasn't a surprise attack this time. Um, the British knew they were here, obviously, and uh, the Americans marched onto the island. The British marched in Fort Mackinac, and they engaged in a battle at the center of Mackinac Island in uh, August uh, 1814. About evenly matched, um, uh, there was a turning point in the battle, however, where the British got uh, uh, the best of the Americans. Uh, a number of American soldiers were killed. Uh, they eventually uh, called retreat, and um, the British were victorious here at Mackinac Island throughout the War of 1812. It was only returned to uh, America as part of the, the Treaty of Ghent uh, the following year. Fort Holmes was built by the British. It really wasn't a separate fort. It was part of the operation of Fort Mackinac, um, and they originally called it Fort George. They built that right after they captured Fort Mackinac um, during the War of 1812 to protect uh, Mackinac from the rear. Again, they had exploited that flaw. Now they were going to ensure that the Americans couldn't back, come back and, and do the same thing. And uh, it, it protected the, that vulnerable high ground behind Fort Mackinac. When the Americans returned to the island uh, after 1815, they renamed the fort Fort Holmes in honor of an uh, officer who had been killed in the Battle uh, of 1814. The Americans manned it for a few years after that, but very soon they, they, they shut it down. It was no longer necessary. I mean, we were at peace with Great Britain. The nature of warfare had changed. There were now bigger guns on vessels within a few years that if somebody actually would come here to attack Fort Mackinac, they would have attacked from the water. It was abandoned. It returned uh, to dust. But um, beginning in the early 20th century, various uh, reconstructions of it were, were placed up there. A very accurate one was done in the 1930s. And then uh, to commemorate the bicentennial, we did a, f uh, a further reconstruction of the fort and opened that as part of our celebration of the uh, bicentennial of the War of 1812. Fortunately, um, the uh, American government had done some very detailed drawings of the fort while it still existed, and they're uh, in the National Archives in Washington, and they were used both in the 1930s reconstruction and in the most recent one. The Americans took over Fort Mackinac after the War of 1812 again, uh, and they continued to garrison it until 1895. So it was a fort that had a very long history. Um, by the time it shut down in 1895, it was an antique fort. It was actually recognized by the Army for its uh, historic importance in those latter years because a, a lot of forts in American history just didn't last that long. Today, the 14 buildings inside the fort walls are all original. 
These are buildings that were constructed throughout the fort's history, the oldest dating to 1780, uh, the block houses to the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, the rest of the structures completed over the following decades. The, the final one was completed in 1885. So nothing reconstructed here at Fort Mackinac. Again, all original arming buildings, some of the oldest standing structures in the state of Michigan. The walls of Fort Mackinac, officer stone quarters started by the British. That's the oldest public building anywhere in Michigan today. Stone quarters, the oldest building at Fort Mackinac, was started by the British in 1780, never completed by them, but the Americans completed it when they took over the fort in 1796. And it was used as an officer's quarters, so it's officer's stone quarters. It's a duplex dwelling, so one officer, his family occupied one half, another officer and his family the, the other half. Comfortable quarters, uh, stunning views from the front of it. Uh, bathrooms and flush toilets were installed in the 1880s, so uh, by that time it was a very modern building. It contains exhibits today showing how the building was used during uh, the American occupancy. And on the lower level is our tea room, uh, our restaurant here at Fort Mackinac, providing the best views of any restaurant on Mackinac Island. You know, as I noted, there's a lot of really old buildings inside um, uh, Fort Mackinac, the oldest standing public building in Michigan, and Stone Quarters, and next to it is the oldest standing hospital building in, uh, in the state of Michigan. Uh, the Post Hospital, um, uh, uh, used here for, for many years after its construction. It was replaced by a hospital in the 1850s, a new one was built here, and after that it served as a, as a storehouse and, 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 and other uh, other purposes at the fort, um, but uh, again, the oldest standing hospital building in the state of Michigan today. Uh, surrounding the parade ground at Fort Mackinac are a number of buildings. They um, housed officers, uh, soldiers' barracks right behind me here, the, the barracks for the, the majority of the enlisted men here at Fort Mackinac, a guardhouse, um, the office, uh, commissary, quartermaster storehouse, all those typical buildings that you found at most military installations in the 19th century to support the, the officers and the troops uh, that were here. In addition to officers' stone quarters, we also have officers' hill quarters uh, uh, looking down upon the parade ground. It, like stone quarters, was a duplex dwelling. Um, uh, so one officer and his family uh, off occupying one half, another occupying the other. And then beyond it, outside the fort walls, are two later officers' quarters, which are used for um, housing of dignitaries and VIPs who visit uh, uh, Mackinac Island. Uh, but those four buildings here at Fort Mackinac uh, housed all the officers here. Some non-commissioned officers were housed in buildings out back behind the fort. They still exist today. Again, they're used for other purposes rather than uh, museum exhibits. So a long history. Um, now, uh, its military importance faded um, uh, after the War of 1812. Again, we were at peace with Great Britain and, and Canada. Uh, with the decline of the fur trade in the 1830s. Um, Mackinac became a little backwater for a while, um, but so it was a kind of a quiet, sleepy post by the 1830s and uh, really didn't have any strategic importance. And at times, all the soldiers were pulled out of here to fight distant battles. Um, Indian uprisings in Florida in the 1830s, the Mexican War in the 1840s, again during the Civil War, uh, the fort became very sleepy, usually just one caretaker left behind to, to look after the fort. But again, Again, it was an official military post and those soldiers always returned once those conflicts were over. Uh, what gave Fort Mackinac a new lease on life in 1875 was the establishment of Mackinac National Park, the second national park in America. Yellowstone had just been established a few years before that. Mackinac became our second national park and a second company of soldiers was dispatched up here to Fort Mackinac to help care for the park because there was no park service back then. It was the soldiers at Mackinac who took care of this early national park. This was true out in Yellowstone as well. And then with the closing of Fort Mackinac by the Army in 1895, well, uh, there were no longer soldiers here to care for the national park. So at that time, Mackinac National Park was transferred to the state of Michigan and Mackinac Island became Mackinac Island State Park, the first state park in Michigan. And it remains a park today, uh, uh, almost 125 years old. to place my thumb over the vent hole 
and he's going to be taking our first tool called the gunner's auger or the gunner's worm. We have cannon firings daily here uh, throughout the summer season, as well as rifle firings. The public enjoys these demonstrations very much, uh, and they, they highlight the, the military aspect of the fort and some of the things that the soldiers here spent their time drilling in and learning about. The cannon, back in the Victorian period here, was often used uh, commemoratively, uh, fired for celebrations and to mark certain events, and that's how we use it today. Uh, we don't fire cannonballs down into the, the city or the harbor, but they really didn't back in the 1880s either anymore. It was, uh, again, we always fired to welcome people to celebrate things, and that's what we do at Fort Mackinac all summer. We welcome uh, tens of thousands of visitors here, and part of their visit is to be welcomed by a, a big cannon blast up on the upper gun platform. Last week we got a look at how to properly harvest birch bark. Tonight it gets made into a trumpet. My name is Minna Hokka and I live in Koskitel in Finland, Southwest Finland, teaching workshops in folk school and my Desire and task is to teach people how to build traditional wind instruments that has been have been used in Finland and Karelia from the late Stone Age to 1950. The oldest of them is birch bark trumpet, which has been used at least thousand years. Which was originally built in Burgos to frighten the wolves and bears and other wild animals from cattle and for signaling people different messages. They had agreed beforehand what means a certain rhythm of notes. kind of connects us to nature and earlier generations. And also it's very good to have instruments that are not standardized. After the workshop in the Heritage Center, where I built this beautiful trumpet, Minna and I headed back to the woods to create another one from start to finish. Take one strip that goes around, pull downwards and with loose eye, I try to get it as wide as possible. If I want it, want wider than this, then I can make with knife a spiral that goes all the way down. Minna said the ideal width of the strip is at least two inches and at least 20 feet long for a small trumpet. Now we can test what kind of horn it would be. Minna trimmed the starting end a little narrower and scraped off any bumps or rough spots that would cause the layers not to fit tightly against each other. Next she started by wrapping the bark around a small stick. A couple of times around, layers are covering each other get it a little bit more convenient to blow, then we start to add length. Half about goes to on previous layer. Tightly against each other, no air should escape between layers. A little bit oh, taken away from here. Only that part that going under the next layer. Then you could start 
making carve carvy In 2007 or 8, I was asked to have give workshops and concerts with these instruments, and that has also kept me going on this path because people want to learn these instruments and. I don't want to be the last one who makes these and it's very much fun to play together these instruments. To close the end layers together, Minna sharpened the ends of a stick and poked it through the end of the trumpet. She showed us other methods of fastening the end with handmade clothespins or small sticks boiled to soften them and thread it through the bark. It doesn't really give too good sound yet. Glue would help and maybe it gets open too fast. Those models that are made of little bit thinner birch bark have a little better qualities. I could play the other one. Alright, now how do I do this? Um, at first, yes, keep your lips together and make this kind of sound. <laughs> yes, Not lips like are vibrating against each other. <laughs> and you can have more air pressure and less air pressure to get High tones, you need more air pressure and pretty kind of angry looks, I would say. Give sound. Do you I want to people feel they are musical too? Even though somebody might have told different things. And if they have just, they haven't found the right instrument <laughs> before. <laughs> It's so wild. <laughs> it takes time to tame it. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. <laughs>